For those of you that don't know me, I am Paul Cherick. I am the uh, Associate Director for External Partnerships here at the Anlinger Center. And uh, I've been given the pleasure and daunting task of introducing someone that I think, to many of you, doesn't need an introduction, and that is Norm Augustine. So Norm, thank you for coming today and uh, participating in this event. Um, it really is spectacular to, to have you here. Uh, he's a member of the, the great class of 1957. Um, I know that's often said tongue-in-cheek around here, but I think Norm is really the reason why you say this. <laughs> so he got his uh, BSE degree here in MAE in, in 57, like I said, and then a master's degree also from Princeton in 1959. And then things got really interesting. You know, I think a lot of people, well, we can probably count how many people have those degrees, but then, then Norm really distinguished himself. So uh, you can go through the normal trajectory of all of the wonderful things Norm has done in his career. Um, he has been in just about every major sector of our society professionally. He's been in academia here at Princeton. He's been in the government sector, uh, and serving uh, in the undersecretary of the army, where he is famous for coming up with Augustine's Law, and I'll let you look that up <laughs> and see what that is. Um, but I think more importantly ab ab about Norm is he's sort of the embodiment of a Princeton undergraduate. And uh, even though he came through the engineering side, he does have the embodiment of this liberal arts ideal that we, we so much uh, cherish here at the university. And, uh, you know, as someone who travels a lot, Emily, you travel a lot, you know, I think we could sum up our country's traveled to and probably not even reach half of the 111 that Norm has been to. He stood on both poles of the planet. I mean, that's, that's really remarkable. I, I'm, just, I'm just stunned by this. So you don't even have to say anything today. I'm just really blown away by all these uh, really fascinating things. So he's a mem mem uh, member of the National Academy of Science, Sciences, National Academy of Engineering, National Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, he's been awarded the National Medal of uh, Technology. And uh, actually, it was, it was funny. I, I, in preparing for this uh, very eloquent introduction, I, I went back and, and encountered an article that, that Norm wrote for the Wall Street Journal in 2011. And, and I honestly can say I, I remember reading that uh, when, you, when it came out. Um, I'm a loyal, uh, avid reader of the Wall Street Journal. And, uh, and I encourage you all to look this up and read it. It's about sort of the importance of, of uh, history and, and history as a, as a course in, in our uh, education in addition to the normal thing that we always talk about, which is STEM. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll try to keep this short so you can get as much time as, as possible, Norm. So again, uh, welcome back to Princeton. We, we always enjoy having you here, and we really look forward to your, to your lecture. Well, Paul, thank you very much for that kind introduction. And it was very generous for a time there. I wasn't sure you were still talking about me. And, <laughs> Uh, in that vein, there's a story, a true story, I always like to tell to Brits and uh, audiences. Uh, it, on my first day of the faculty here, I, when up to that time, I spent my entire career either in government or in industry, and I was asked to give the welcoming uh, lecture to the incoming freshman engineers. And uh, as the dean was making his own opening remarks, I wasn't paying much attention, frankly, to what he was saying. And all of a sudden, I heard him say, now we will hear from Professor Augustine. And this is absolutely true. The thought went through my mind for just an instant that, geez, that's a coincidence. They've got some guy here by the same name as me. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. Uh, on the other hand, I think my credentials are, uh, at least as viewed by the New York Times, are somewhat uh, suspect. Uh, when I received an honorary degree from Princeton, and needless to say, I was enormously honored by that. Uh, I, the, the New York Times carried a story about the event the next day, and the, the headline of the New York Times story read, Muhammad Ali and three others received Princeton degrees. So <laughs> life is that way. Uh, whatever the case I am, I, I, I'm doubly pleased to be here today, one, because it's always Something I love to do is come back to Princeton. And Princeton is a place that truly changed my life. Uh, and today, uh, the Andlinger Center, which is a place that can truly change the world. Uh, I realize that's an expansive claim. However, uh, there are very few topics today that are more consequential than the environment and energy. And together, they certainly play fundamental uh, roles in uh, how the what might be the outcome in areas from uh, national security of the nuclear age to the global economy uh, to uh, our ability to continue to survive on this planet. 
and indeed the uh, enormous talent that underpins the Edgar Center, uh, together with the uh, this this unbelievable building that the Edgar Center has. Uh, it's, this is my first time to be in it. Uh, I think brings together the opportunity to really make a, a, a significant con uh, contribution. Uh, I can't help but remark at this point that I think the center has been extremely well served over its uh, young life uh, by the leadership of Emily Carter. And uh, I know that the engineering school where I graduated is going to benefit greatly from the good fortune of having her as the next dean and to be able to build on the enormous accomplishments that, uh, that, uh, that uh, Vince Poor has brought to the engineering school here at Princeton. A few years ago, one of the energy groups with which I'm associated, uh, it's composed of former government officials, uh, was asked at a press conference if the problem with America's energy program, or energy pursuits, if you will, is that we don't, as a nation, have an energy policy. And one of our members, a former U.S. Senator, a highly regarded fellow, uh, commented uh, to the reporter, he said, but we do have an energy policy. Uh, our policy is... Uh, to support a foreign cartel by importing billions of barrels of oil and sending them billions of dollars, some of which they could use to fund terrorists who destroy, try to destroy us. That's our energy policy. Well, it was a bit brutal, uh, but as one thinks about it, uh, our energy policy has been a challenge over the years and still, in my view, requires a lot of refinement. Uh, at that time, our nation, and even more so Europe, were very heavily uh, dependent upon imported foreign energy, which is the lifeblood of a modern economy. Then technology intervened uh, to make an enormous, unexpected, and in my view, very fortunate uh, change. Uh, namely, the U.S. was presented with an opportunity, I might even call it a reprieve, of a magnitude that is, I think, difficult to overstate in the short term. I refer, of course, to the advancements in horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing, which, although a mixed blessing, uh, uh, have had some major uh, positive impacts. Uh, it's been, we're all aware of the drop in the price of oil, a precipitous drop that's reduced our dependence on foreign energy commensurately. Uh, based on present consumption rates, uh, it's been said that we have over 100 years' supply of uh, recoverable. Uh, natural gas from uh, from shale, uh, and while not without its hazards, properly executed, uh, it's my view that uh, fracking could buy us the time that uh, we need to do better. Uh, the global political equation, of course, changed uh, overnight with this. For example, uh, the IMF has said that it stripped a, th a third of a trillion dollars a year from the uh, revenues of Arab oil exporting nations, that it increasingly the tankers that leave the Hormuz Straits are heading east instead of west. On the other hand, as promising as uh, shale gas may be, it too ultimately is very limited in quantity. Furthermore, while natural gas is clean compared to coal and oil, uh, it's certainly not clean in an absolute sense. And for example, uh, if one considers uh, 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 carbon dioxide emissions that are th some 30% lower per BTU uh, for uh, natural gas than for uh, oil and 44% less than coal. A uh, skeptic might say that uh, they're actually 56% as great uh, for uh, uh, coal and 30, 70% as polluting as oil, uh, at least insofar as carbon dioxide is concerned. To me, the greatest benefit of hydraulic fracking, fracturing is going to be the time it's bought to do the very kinds of things that the Andlinger Center was established to do, uh, namely to pursue clean, affordable, safe, sustainable energy. And a few years ago, another group that uh, I've been working with, uh, seven of us in this particular case, uh, all former or present at the time, CEOs of uh, Fortune 100 companies, none of whom were in the energy business, uh, were having a conversation. We all became very concerned about where our nation was headed in terms of developing clean energy support, uh, uh, sources. Uh, 
we formed a little group, uh, the seven of us, and uh, devoted a great deal of our personal time uh, to this subject. Uh, you may have seen uh, some of our reports that have come out. Uh, you may even seen you know, the full-page editorials that we ran that were generously funded by one of our group, uh, Bill Gates. And the editorials pictured a large bowl of potato chips and a caption stating that America is spending more money on potato chips than it is on clean energy research, which was a fact. Uh, because of this and the, the enormous capital investments that are associated with uh, uh, introducing new forms of primary energy uh, and also the long amortization periods that go with that, uh, we're very likely to have hydrocarbons play a major role in our nation and the world's energy supply for decades to come, no matter what we do. Uh, there are roughly 100 quads of energy that are consumed in the U.S. each year. As you probably know, petroleum provides about 35 percent, natural gas 28, coal 17, and all other uh, sources together uh, provide just 10 percent, a little less than that. Professor Vaclav Smil of the University of Manitoba once calculated that it, takes, it took almost 60 years for worldwide energy use, uh, which up at that, till that time had been based uh, largely on the burning of wood. Uh, it took almost 60 years to transition from wood and 5% coal to 40% coal. Similarly, it took 60 years to uh, convert from 5% uh, oil to 40% oil. And with the passage of a similar 60 years, natural gas has barely uh, reached 25% of worldwide consumption. The message being that change comes very slowly in the energy world, partly because of the uh, large uh, invested capital. Uh, the occupants of our planet uh, all obviously share uh, eventually the same water, same air. And the abuse of the, those substances can certainly be expected to have dire effects. And I know yesterday you heard a good deal about some of those effects. Uh, th this, I think, is likely to be particularly true in those parts of the world where they have very brittle societies uh, even today. Now, I, I very recently returned from a month traveling in West Africa in 12 different countries. And while I'm certainly no expert in environmental matters, I, it struck me that... Uh, this enormous and very poorly controlled experiment we're running with our planet uh, is likely to have particularly great repercussions in human terms in those countries that are likely to spill out into the rest of the world. And I, I say that uh, much of the population of West Africa, as is true of much of the world's population, uh, is coastal. Uh, the average person in West Africa lives on a dollar a day. Uh, over the years, uh, disease, uh, conflict, and corrupt uh, leadership uh, has taken its toll. Uh, Health care is minimal. Uh, in Sierra Leone, we're told there are 24 medical doctors in the entire country, all trained in Cuba. Uh, much of the Af African continent, even today, uh, from the, uh, the Sahara down to the uh, uh, Namibian desert, uh, uh, in increments uh, is, is desert today. And uh, water is an extremely short supply. And it, it would seem that if a fuse is, ignite, is needed to ignite further armed conflict on that continent that could spill over elsewhere in the form of human migration, uh, the lack of water could be it. And then several countries, not those countries, but others I've traveled in in Africa, uh, government leaders have told me, uh, told others, of plans they're making to build dams, to dam rivers. Uh, this is a continent with 54 countries, and so when you build a dam, there are a lot of countries downstream uh, that are impacted. And it would seem that uh, it takes a little imagination uh, to visualize how this could uh, uh, trigger a conflict on a much broader scale. As I see it, uh, the only lasting uh, solution to the world's, our planet's energy challenges uh, is nuclear fusion. And when I was a student uh, here at Princeton 60 years ago, I asked the, some of the scientists working on Project Matterhorn uh, how long it would be uh, before uh, we had uh, commercial nuclear fusion on the grid. And I should confess that this was at a time when gasoline cost 19 cents a gallon 
except when there were price wars and it dropped to 11 cents a gallon. In any event, the answer these scientists gave me uh, to my question was uh, 30 years. Well, not very long ago, I asked some scientists working on a major fusion project the same question. The answer they gave me was 30 years. And I told them that I was very encouraged that we hadn't lost any time. <laughs> uh, uh, in commercial fusion, uh, the uh, co commercial fusion power, uh, the number 30, I think, is a constant. It's like E or pi or C or something like that. Uh, it should be, of course, noted that uh, there are those, and particularly those who are associated with small research firms, that are far more optimistic uh, on the subject. But with today's uh, budgets for clean energy research, and particularly for nuclear fusion, uh, I would have to say, uh, no pun intended, that they are swimming against the current. Uh, worse yet, uh, to a substantial segment of the world's population now, the word nuclear has become a four-letter word. Uh, read uh, Chernobyl or Three Mile Island or Fukushima. Uh, if we don't invest in and succeed in developing uh, practicable nuclear fusion, uh, we may in fact be destined uh, with no alternative to go back to uh, far more uh, nuclear fission with the uh, baggage that that implies. One has to view with optimism recent advancements in such fields as photovoltaics in terms of wind power, smart grids, and so on and so on. Uh, these advancements, uh, they've been significant uh, compared with prior advancements in the field at least. On the other hand, uh, if you take all these together, it seems that we are likely in the foreseeable future to solve only a part, a small part probably, of the energy uh, challenge. Uh, for many forms of energy, uh, storage becomes a, a, a major building block, uh, obstacle. Uh, this is particularly true because the intermittency of many of these forms of, uh, of clean energy, also because if you're driving down the street with your battery-powered car, long extension cords get in the way. Uh, so I, I, th I think that one of the major things that uh, where there's an opportunity for improvement has to be in energy storage. Uh, the advancements that have been made in the field in recent decades, and there have been some, uh, would nonetheless, as I view them, uh, have to be viewed as uh, having been on the margin. Uh, what we really need are quantum improvements, uh, not uh, small gains. Uh, the former are going to require novel concepts that are often going to require uh, very high cost, very risky, uh, research and development. Uh, lithium air batteries are promising, as are many other things, uh, but will they ultimately represent uh, just another step, uh, modest step in a series of gains? Uh, or is there something we can do that truly will uh, make a huge step in energy storage? And uh, certainly when you compare the progress in storage of energy with the progress in fields like uh, uh, genomics or certain materials, uh, semiconductor integrated circuits or nanotechnology or optics, uh, uh, the gains in energy storage uh, by that scale have to be viewed indeed as modest. Uh, and recall that lithium ion cells have now been around for about a quarter of a century and they don't show no signs of disappearing in the immediate future. Uh, the needed breakthroughs are unlikely to come simply from working harder on the things we've been working hard on all along. Uh, nor are these advancements likely to be derived from industry working in isolation from universities, working in isolation from our government, working in isolation from the policymakers in our government. As is the case with so many uh, technical, technological advancements of hydraulic fracturing, fracturing being just one, uh, breakthroughs are likely to be the consequences of scientists and engineers from government laboratories, uh, from universities, from industry, uh, working together with policymakers uh, and together uh, bringing uh, not only the knowledge base but the financial resources that are needed. And I'll come back to the latter. Uh, unfortunately, though, uh, many of the many uh, roadblocks today exist ranging from those uh, concerning intellectual property to uh, funding to conflicts of interest to, to uh, uh, traditional prerogatives. Uh, uh, 
they stand in the way of these four institutions uh, working closely together. Uh, breakthroughs in a field as complex as uh, the provision of energy on a large scale are not uncommonly found at the, at the seams of science, and engineering, and technology, and uh, public policy. Uh, and uh, one of the things that this great institution brings is uh, uh, pieces of all of uh, uh, these fields. Uh, let me offer an example that's borrowed from a very different field, although it has to do with energy in a way, uh, that points out uh, the point I'm trying to make. Uh, and I'm referring to uh, a field that's very dependent on small, highly reliable uh, energy storage devices, namely artificial hearts. Uh, not very long ago, there was a group of engineers and cardiologists at uh, one of the better known American universities uh, were meeting. It was the first time they had met as a group from the engineering school and the, the cardiology department. And uh, they were talking about the possibility they could work together to build a truly practicable artificial heart. Uh, ironically, uh, they had, as I said, just not met before on any occasions to speak of. And as the one of the cardiologists began the presentation speaking about the requirements that would have to be met if an artificial heart uh, were to be, were to replace uh, a, a human heart, a normal heart, a biological heart. Uh, he was interrupted. Uh, he was interrupted by an engineer who asked, uh, would it be possible to, instead of putting the heart here in your chest, to put it in your thigh where it would be easier to get at it? Well, it stopped the, stopped the meeting. Uh, people who spent their whole, entire lives studying cardiology, it had never occurred to them that you might do something like that. Well, in any event, the, uh, after the surprise silence, the, the speaker continued and was soon interrupted by another engineer. And uh, uh, the other engineer uh, said, uh, would it be possible, uh, instead of having just one heart, could you have three or four hearts distributed around your body? and have greater reliability. Well, that really stopped the meeting. <laughs> and uh, the end, I'm told, was uh, the meeting was viewed by everyone present. I wasn't there. Everyone present as having been an enormous success that had uh, opened people's minds to things that they'd been thinking about all their lives but had never thought of. Uh, in this regard, uh, I always like to point out that a recent survey to, define, to identify the five major advancements in medicine as viewed by practicing physicians over the last uh, two decades, uh, the answer came out with three of the top five were pure engineering. It had really relatively little to do with medicine. And so it's this collaboration, bringing together this strong, uh, 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 diverse experience base that seems to make a difference in the world, that, uh, complex worlds like the ones you're challenging. And indeed, uh, that's one of the great strengths of the Enlinger Center, just as is represented in this room here today. Uh, the opportunities for out-of-the-box thinking and energy R&D and environmental preservation would seem to be boundless. In the Pentagon, we would have referred to it as a target-rich battlefield. Uh, for example, we've learned uh, to engineer microbes that could serve as the workers in an energy factory. Uh, in fact, we're finding that there are recoverable sources of energy in virtually every waste product uh, known to humanity uh, that uh, can be uh, uh, put to work, uh, ranging from sewage to spit. And as I've noted, uh, substantial gains have been made in areas such as photovoltaic devices and efficiencies thereof. And also, uh, it's a field that we shouldn't overlook, and that's uh, reducing energy consumption. Unfortunately, though, in our endeavor, we're not likely to progress uh, far without certain policy changes to accompany our scientific and technological pursuits. Uh, this is particularly the case, I think, as it relates to uh, U.S. industry. Uh, when I graduated from Princeton and entered the industrial world, uh, the average shareholder of in all firms in America held their stock for eight years. Uh, today, the average shareholder holds their stock for four years. This does not encourage CEOs of corporations to invest in research. Uh, shareholders, frankly, don't care what happens to your country 10 years or even 10 months from now. This is an unfortunate uh, set of, I think, poor judgment, but uh, I believe it's factual. Uh, research in, particularly, in particular 
is going to have to depend very largely on federal funding for its support, along with certain changes in the tax laws that I could suggest uh, that would uh, cause industry to behave very differently. I'll come to that. Uh, energy research is a public good. It uh, serves the public, and therefore its uh, cost, risk, and duration being rather high leads to the conclusion that it's the sort of thing that governments are created to support. In the United States, uh, industry is used to, industry used to fund about two-thirds of the R&D conducted in this country. Today, uh, that's flipped. Industry now supports about one-third, and it's all, excuse me, industry does now two-thirds. The government does one-third. The problem is that industry share is almost all D, and not much R. Uh, yet today, the U.S. government ranks 29th among the world's nations in the share of the nation's research that is federally funded. We rank 23rd among the world's nations in the fraction of research that we do invest as our government uh, into energy uh, research and development. We've fallen from first place in recent decades to 10th place in uh, uh, R&D intensity, and we've fallen from first to seventh place in uh, our research intensity among the world's nations. China is almost certain to pass us in the next decade, both in absolute terms and in uh, intensity terms, intensity being, of course, uh, as a fraction of GDP, uh, within the next decade. Uh, the United States recently joined with a group of countries that had pledged to double their uh, R&D investment in energy research over the next five years. And this, in my view, is a enormously significant step forward. It also speaks very highly, I think, of the leadership of Secretary Ernie Moniz and his group uh, in getting the Congress's greater attention to the importance of this topic. Uh, but as the chief financial officer of the company I used to uh, work with uh, used to tell me when he thought I was getting over exuberant about some technological idea that somebody had, he would always say, show me the cash. And so far, the cash has not been forthcoming. Uh, ARPA-E, for example, it's widely claimed to be one of the greatest R&D uh, achievements in, in a decade, is now being systemically, systematically starved. Uh, when ARPA-E was set up, it was intended that within a few years it have a billion dollar a year budget. Uh, today, it has only a tiny fraction of that. And this is in spite of continued superb leadership and, uh, and ex extraordinary results. Similarly, our great universities, and particularly our great public research universities, that over the past dozen years have suffered nearly a 30% reduction in per student real uh, uh, support from states. There are no position to underwrite major research uh, projects. Uh, as they fight exploding tuition along with the prospect of further reductions in research spending. It shouldn't go unpassed uh, uh, from notice that the Congressional Budget Office has pointed out that if we stay on the path we're now on, that by the year 2032, that's not that far, far away, the year 2032, the entire federal revenue stream will cover only two budget categories, namely uh, uh, entitlements and interest on the debt. There will be no national security, no highways, no education, no research funds whatsoever if we don't change our practices, all of which points to a, a ever more demanding uh, challenge for those of us who care about research in general and research in energy in particular. Foundations, of course, are a very important source of uh, an individual's of support for research witness this building, uh, but that fraction is relatively small, also is targeted usually at the interests of the benefactor. Finally, there are the national labs, which are ideally suited to pursue long-term, high-risk, high-cost uh, research and development efforts, uh, are encumbered by a plethora of uh, IP, conflict of interest, uh, regulatory personnel policies, and so on down the line that are strangling their ability to uh, reach their true potential. Other challenges face university research, uh, such as the unreimbursable portion of uh, research that's conducted in our institutions. Uh, in fact, research, at, uh, if it were conducted in industry as it is in academia, would be viewed as a loss later. In addition, surveys show that uh, university uh, uh, researchers working under federal grants spend 42% of their time 
not conducting research, but rather spend it on complying with regulations, just filling out reports, writing proposals, uh, the latter of which have about one chance of five and even being funded at the NIH and the NSF and way less than that at ARPA-E. Uh, there are known solutions to most of these problems, and uh, uh, they include the practice of ARPA-E, of NQTEL, the Penn State IP model, something that I've been promoting uh, together with the American Physical Society that would uh, create an independent uh, research foundation uh, that would be built with funds raised through uh, tax uh, exemptions uh, that would encourage U.S. firms that today have paid taxes abroad on work abroad, projects abroad, uh, that amount to $2.1 trillion, that's with a T, that are now sitting overseas unspent that companies won't bring back because they'll have to pay t taxes twice. And were that tax rate decreased greatly and the money used to create a research bank, uh, we could uh, have a huge impact on some of these high-risk long-term undertakings. Another beneficial step would be to change the capital gains tax case uh, tax, uh, so that if you hold an asset for uh, one day, the gain on that asset is taxed at a 99% rate. If you hold it for 10 years, the tax is 1% rate. And you draw a monotonic line between those points. Think how differently CEOs would behave. Think how differently investors would behave. Uh, particularly think how the day traders would change their lives. Finally, uh, our nation's reluctance to invest in research uh, at appropriate levels has to do with the inability to attract uh, young people, or it impacts the young people, uh, to careers in research and engineering. And as a nation, we rank 79th today in the fraction of, uh, of, uh, of baccalaureate degrees that are awarded. In the, we rank 79th in the world as a nation in the fraction of baccalaureate degrees that are awarded in engineering. Uh, the country closest to us in that regard uh, is Mozambique. Uh, today, uh, a youth in America who uh, is uh, in the top quartile academically, but has parents in the bottom quartile economically, has slightly less chance of getting through college, graduating, than a youth, high school youth, uh, who is in the bottom quartile academically, but the top quartile in terms of their parents' wealth. Is that the American dream? Uh, the bottom line is that if one wants to solve unique problems, one has to think out of the box. And to make that point, I'd like to share an actual experience about thinking out of the box. Uh, it it uh, has to do with energy, but a very different application of energy than uh, this meeting addresses. Uh, when I was working at Martin Marietta, an uh, aerospace company a long time ago, uh, we had been awarded a contract to take 8,000 pounds out of the weight of the large fuel tank uh, that uh, propels the space shuttle into orbit. It, it carried uh, 1,600,000 pounds of liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen. I calculated once that if you put that fuel tank on its side, the Wright brothers' entire flight could have taken place inside the fuel tank. In any event, we were given a contract to take 8,000 pounds out of that fuel tank. And, the engineers went at it with enthusiasm. They got about 7,200 pounds out of the tank and uh, hit a wall and didn't seem to be able to find the other ounces at a time. Then one day there was a group of engineers who were standing around a, a table talking about the problem, trying to come up with ideas. And a fellow from the factory happened to walk by and listened to him for a while and spoke out and said, uh, why don't you not paint the fuel tank white? And there was a moment of silence. One of the engineers, true story, one of the engineers said, uh, because space hardware is always painted white. <laughs> uh, these are highly paid engineers. I do mostly trained at Yale, but uh, <laughs> in, in, in any event, they were my colleagues. I was proud of them. In any event, uh, this inquisitor fortunately didn't give up, but he said, well, why don't you not paint this space hardware white? There was more silence. Finally, there is a scramble off to the files to see what the paint weighed. It turned out the paint weighed 800 pounds. Contract solved. Uh, the, uh, the point being that uh, sometimes the best way to think out of the box is to find somebody who's not in the box. And uh, because of that uh, finding, you may remember the first 10 or so flights of the space shuttle were white. Uh, the, the fuel tank in the last 125 or so uh, were the natural orange color of this spray-on foam insulation. 
So by bringing together the assets uh, represented by this, this institution here, the Anlinger Center, uh, with industry, with other universities, particularly with government policymakers, uh, I think we have an opportunity to uh, convince the Congress and the administration to provide the kind of funds that are needed if we're to solve the energy and environment challenges that our nation and the world faces. Uh, it won't be easy, but I'm an optimist. But we do have a lot of work to do, and thank you for inviting me today to talk a little bit about it. Thank you. Okay, so uh, Norm's happy to answer questions, and uh, as in the past, please identify yourself and wait until the microphone arrives. Uh, Ed Saliga, class of 75, civil engineering. Uh, Norm, thanks for the presentation. It's uh, an eye opener. I have a lot of friends who are campaigning here locally in the area against the pipelines for frack gas. And uh, to jump to the point, uh, they think it locks us in too many years into a, an infrastructure. I mean, to your point, the infrastructure of energy changes but slowly. If we expend the billions on pipelines, then we're locked in perhaps longer and, and it becomes much more convenient to just stay on the fossil fuel, the fossil habit. It looks like a lot of the gas is destined for export. Uh, LNG markets around the world being very strong. How do you factor that in into a, a strategy? I mean, how do you balance that? It's a, it's a great question, and I, I somewhat share the perspective of your friend. Uh, it, it, clearly, uh, when you build pipelines, in uh, uh, the spirit of, uh, of full disclosure, I used to be on the board of uh, uh, Conical Phillips for many years. Uh, when you build pipelines, uh, like from the Alieska pipeline, uh, it's a huge cost, and you say they're going to be around for, for decades and decades. And so uh, you, you're basically making a very long-term decision uh, uh, in terms of not only money, but in terms of limiting your flexibility to introduce new, better ideas. And uh, I tend to be one that my personal strategy is something like that would be to do what you have to do to survive in the short term but to do the best you can, having done that, optimize the long term. And uh, what that means in any specific case obviously varies. Uh, we are headed, I think, to a case where we're exporting uh, much of the uh, uh, energy from the, uh, Alaska in particular and Canada uh, outside the country. And as you all know, uh, many of the uh, LNG facilities that were designed to bring LNG into the country may be taking it out. Uh, when they're modified. So we're looking at a very different world than we've seen before. See, I saw another hand here somewhere. Yeah. I'm uh, Bob Williams with the Anlinger Center, and thank you for that wonderful talk. I have a question uh, relating to carbon capture and storage technology. In sharp contrast to the incredible project progress we've been making with intermittent renewables, wind, and especially PV, the global CCS enterprise is essentially grinding to a halt. Many projects were launched, were, were planned, you know, seven or eight years ago. Most of them have been canceled. And the few that are going forward are costing much more than was originally intended. And I think that the, one of the things that this illustrates is a failing we've had in U.S. energy policy is we don't know how to manage the demonstration and early mover projects for large-scale technologies. And even though many of these renewable technologies are very small-scale, we're still going to have large-scale projects in our energy mix for a very long time to come. And this issue has it essentially worked its way out of people's minds in this country because of the sharply declining role of coal in the energy sector because of the shale gas rev revolution and what's going on with regard to intermittent renewables. But there is a coal renaissance taking place in Asia where the number, uh, the, the, the installed capacity for the plants that have been built and, and, and under construction and planned since 2010 is essentially equal to the total capacity worldwide for coal in 2010. Most of that is in Asia, not just in China, but in India, in Indonesia, Philippines, Vietnam, and countries like that. And I want to ask you a question that relates to an organization that you've been involved with, which is this American Energy Innovation Council that recommended several years ago that we find a way to introduce quasi-public corporations to manage these large-scale demonstrations and, 
and other early mover projects for new technologies that are desirable. And I'm wondering what you think the prospects of that recommendation are at this point. Well, you point to an important problem, and it, this group uh, that you allude to, which I mentioned, uh, uh, did indeed make such a proposal. And the answer to your question of what has come of it, uh, I'm sorry, the report is the answer to that part is not much. Some of the other things we propose are making the R&D tax credit permanent and so on did happen. I, one of the challenges is I look at the energy world and I spent a lot of my career in the micro, microelectronics world. In the microelectronics world, when you build a, 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 a bench demonstration of, of feasibility, uh, it's not too hard a step to get from there uh, to production. But in the energy world, uh, when you prove the feasibility of some new energy source, uh, or some energy source that had been used before, uh, then there's this second huge chasm you've got to get over that you allude to, and that is, is, is it economically sensible at scale? And that's a big, costly step that most companies can't afford, uh, particularly when they're sitting there with investments that they've been making for 30 years. And so people, talk, people in Silicon Valley talk about the valley of death, uh, to me, in the energy world, there are two valleys of death. There's this first one, the feas feasibility issue that you could deal with with prototypes and so on. But there's a second one that you have to build things at scale. Uh, uh, small modular reactors is a, kind of an interesting example that some of you may have worked in uh, that gets hung up on this, as do other things. And uh, Our thought was that if the government is not going to fund this sort of thing, they'll fund the first step. And in microelectronics and materials and so on, industry will fund the second step, the second value of uh, death. Uh, is there a way that corporations could come together uh, without violating the antitrust laws, pool their money, and perhaps be able to set up consortia that uh, uh, would fund this second step? And that was our proposal. Uh, we ran into all kinds of antitrust policy uh, issues and money issues, to put it bluntly. And, Right now, the issue that uh, I spend a lot, I live in Washington, I hate to confess, but I spend a lot of time on Capitol Hill, and money is driving everything. It went aside the election, I put that aside for sure, but uh, it's a lack of funds. ARPA-E uh, was quite wounded in the early budget process here, not, not from the White House, but now Congress, part of the Congress. And uh, that's been turned around, but the problem is that very little gain has been made. Uh, we, we've got orders of magnitude improvement to have to make in our investment policies. And then finally, I'll just have one other quick comment. I think we need to get off the stage here, but uh, a problem that I hope you will think about, those of you who are interested in policy, that I, to this day, have not come up with a good answer, but I think it's a major impediment uh, to industry and government having served it both. And that is that the taxpayers pay for, in a federal lab or pay to have a university conduct research. And uh, the motivation to take that research and turn it into uh, products and put it out in, into use uh, depends on some incentive, usually a financial incentive. But when you set up those incentives, you create conflicts of interest uh, that the people who are the beneficiaries didn't make the original investment. And so th there's this question of what is it legitimate to take out of federal labs, put into industry? Uh, so that uh, it's fair to the taxpayers, to the people who are doing the research, and to the people who are uh, creating the companies and implementing what they've, what they've been working on. I think I need to quit. I think no, I said, no, I thought I saw a big hook over there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's for me. Not oh, for that's you. for you. Right. <laughs> well, I'd be happy to try and answer any other questions anybody might have. This is Dan Steingart from uh, Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering in the Anlinger Center. So, so I have to take the bait. If, if lithium air isn't, isn't good enough, then what's better? I mean, with, within the battery community, there are a lot of eggs thrown at lithium air, but more because it's, it's an untenable couple in terms of cycle life, right? So there's lith lithium, there's air, and then you go a little bit to the right, and you get fluorine. And as far as I can tell, that's, that's all you can get in terms of a closed battery. So, so do you think we should just go to fuel cells, because that, that's the only way you can get a meaningful improvement in large-scale energy density. Well, you, you know so much more about this topic, I'm not going to fall into this trap here. <laughs> but 
I, I will say that I think that's one of the problems in the, the clean energy arena writ large. And that is that we're pushing against physical limits in a lot of cases. Uh, look, at, Take uh, sol solar cells, which we've made huge gains in, but are we likely to see that kind of gain in the future? And as you say, if you don't like lithium air, what do you like? I, I well, frankly don't know what the answer to that is. Yeah, so, so, so then the only comment I would make is, is that it's, it's important to ref I mean, and, and, and this is sort of my, my, my pet cause here, but I think it's important to reframe the energy density conversation because the end is in sight, and we might not like it when we get there because within this closed form, we're going to have to have a lot of cooling around it. So, so there are other vectors that we can go. Power density is, has followed the kind of uh, advances you want. Cycle life needs to get there. But all of the focus, all of the focus, all of the hype is on energy density. So, so I, I think we need to sort of reframe what, what we want as a comment. I'm glad, I'm glad you said that. It's a good point. Okay, I think we have time for one more. It's my old tennis playing buddy. <laughs> Simon Sukaver from the main department. Former tennis player was Norm Augustin. <clears throat> Norm, um, one thing which you mentioned, which is very, in my opinion, important for this country, huge waste of energy. You mentioned a little about this one, and I think you are a very good person to address this more. Huge waste and not using enough research to change waste to energy. If we, for example, example, one simple example is huge waste of energy by a reactor, fission reactors. And we're putting, we don't know what to do, it's a terrible problem. Why not to put more money and more young scientists to working to have idea? There is a lot of could be a lot of idea how to turn around this and, and extract very useful energy back. You have any comment about this? Well, you're, as usual, you're absolutely right. I mean, there's a huge opportunity there, and uh, uh, much of it doesn't require uh, breakthrough science too. It's just a matter of some things that we know how to do. We need to go do. The financial incentives, in many cases, argue against it, unfortunately. But uh, uh, when you th I think of the waste you see in uh, back, this was some time ago, before energy was such an issue. But when I was working in the Pentagon, I can remember sitting in there in the fall wearing a parka in my office uh, because they shut the air conditioning off on August 30th. And it didn't matter what the weather was on August 30th, the air conditioning shut off. And, so we were sitting there freezing, uh, wearing parkas because it wasn't yet August 30th. And uh, you see that kind of thing, not perhaps that extreme, but all around the country. And when you add it together all around the world, it, it, it's absolutely immense. So that's kind of the yin and yang of it, I believe. You can very often see in, in hotels, for example, it is air conditioning working 100% of power and windows are open. And, and people are not doing it because they are meant Delicious. They don't educated enough about this one. I believe this could be very, very important to educate people about wasting energy. It's really true, and uh, I, I should stop now, so I'm going to show bad judgment. But it, we also go overboard the other way. I stayed at the NASA Tavern, NASA Inn. It shows you how old I am. NASA Inn uh, last night, and the light in the room was so dim that. Uh, I'm going to go blind, and so, you know, it saved my hotel bill 30 cents, but I'm going to have to have eye surgery now, so anyway, thank you all.